I hope uh, this evening you experience something that has meaning to your life, uh, something that gives you new perspectives, new understanding of spirituality, of Christianity, and of your journey. This is something for everyone, so you don't have to belong to a particular group or anything like that. That's why we call it mysticism. And for disciples, for mainline denomination, that's a very scary word. In fact, it's a word that makes people uh, run the other way. So the first thing we have to do uh, is explain that word to the mind. But I'm hoping that you'll be here with more than your mind. That's, in fact, what the idea behind mysticism is all about. That it's mind, emotion, spirit, body. Which is why, if you're smelling something strange, you're supposed to be. Nothing's on fire. We just have some Nag Shampa incense from India coming your way. As an example of the fact that all the senses are involved in this spiritual evolution, the spiritual awakening. We have the lights down. We're not inviting just the intellect, we're inviting the senses so that you can feel, taste, see. Hopefully break out of the boxes that uh, we like to live in and that we place our religion in. When in fact it's meant to be holistic, having impact on our whole existence. So as we go back to the ancient ways, to the source, my friends in Europe, Orthodox, that you'll meet here in a minute, like to say going back to the source, to those original impulses and insights and ways that have been diluted down through the centuries, that have been corrupted down through the centuries, that have fragmented and lost their real meaning. So tonight we're going to take a look at those first couple hundred years of this way of seeing the world that has been labeled Christianity. You know, the word Christian was not from the Christians. It's what the outsiders gave them as a name. Followers of the Christ. Christers, if you will. They were, in their words, followers of the way. That's simple. This new way open to humanity. So, let's start with this word mysticism. And as I promised, we're going to satisfy the intellect to begin with. So that it doesn't shut down on us right away. You'll see that word mysticism out of the dictionary. Immediate consciousness of the transcendent or ultimate reality of God. Another one, the experience of such communion as described by mystics. That is to say, encounter, unity, oneness. A belief in the existence of realities beyond perceptual or intellectual apprehension. That are central to being and directly accessible by subjective experience. You know, often we like to differentiate between subjective and objective, and subjective is bad. But when you get into the higher spheres of wisdom, worldwide wisdom, subjective becomes good. Because out of our own personal encounter with what is, we discover something objective. Very zen-like. Very paradoxical. Those of you who go upstairs and have to listen to me on Sunday morning, know that paradoxical is critical to spirituality. There's no way around it. We have to contain several different concepts that seem to contradict each other at the same time. Let's try another one. This is from Evelyn Underhill, the great scholar of the 20th century uh, Christian mysticism. And she says, it's an enhanced life. How about that? Enhanced life. More life. More awareness. More joy. The remaking of character. The remaking of character. And the liberation of a new form of consciousness. A new form of consciousness. I've used the example of seeing from a high building as opposed to from the ground floor. Just a wider perspective. The old story of Einstein seeing a hair in his soup and not getting upset because he knows the galaxies are moving right now. He has a bigger view of the world. The second 
Let me give you a bigger version of it, the second uh, paragraph. Mysticism, according to historical and psychological definitions, is the direct intuition or experience of God. Hopefully, that's what everybody, all of us, anybody on the spiritual path is about. Direct experience of spirit. A mystic is a person who has, to a greater or lesser degree, such a direct experience. One whose religion and life are centered not merely on accepted belief or practice, but on that which he regards as first-hand personal knowledge. First-hand personal experience of things spiritual, of that awesome mystery of the sacred, of the holy dimension of life. Nothing less. You see, part of that dilution that I talked about has often reduced Christianity to sort of a cultural thing, like apple pie, you know, totally part of the culture. And some folks may lament that Christianity is now to the side of the culture. But when it was all mixed in with everything else, it had lost its power. It had lost its depth. Because this is not for everyone come along and just sort of add it to your other things. This is a depth of journeying into experience and reality and destiny that is not undertaken by everybody. Some folks just would rather enjoy the senses and that's it. Some of us are pulled, yearning, like by a magnetic power. We can't explain it for something more than ordinary life. And Christianity at heart, as you will see, is profoundly mystical. How could it not be? We talk about spirit incarnated in matter. In our matter, temples of Holy Spirit. Doesn't get any more mystical than that. Believe it or not, this is not a plug for a book. The book that you find here is available over there, and I get nothing from it, so don't uh, connect it to any merchandising. This is one of the great joys of my life. In one of the translations, or even in the uh, introduction, I say this book changed my life. Because back in 1989, through some other books, I connected with these people, whom you'll meet in a second, who were going back to the source, trying to explain it, share it with modern day people. And that's when I discovered that for a thousand years, we Western world people have been completely cut off from the first thousand years of Christianity, from our own origins. All of us in some way are descending from the Catholic Church and the Reformation, and most of us know nothing about this. So this book here, which is sort of the masterpiece of these folks, these great Christians in Eastern France, is an opportunity to re-encounter these ideas outside of the cultures that locked them into a box. If you go to an Orthodox church today, you're likely to see the Greek culture, Syrian culture, Lebanese culture, and feel very alien to that form of worship. And they have simply grabbed onto the treasure and added their, their ways to it. But it belongs to all of humanity, beyond the form. It came out of here. It didn't come out of basilicas and cathedrals, churches, all of that came out of here. Whether it's an outer desert, an inner desert, the soul alone with itself, with reality. When we stop the noise upstairs long enough, when we need to find out, when we're lost, when we know we're lost, the wilderness. Out of this wilderness came ancient monasteries. This particular one happens to be St. Catherine Monastery. And this is very interesting and meaningful to us because it's there that resides the icon on this book. Fourth century icon. This is not that icon. This is another one you'll see. One of my favorites by Rublev. I even like, as you heard in my sermon the other day, I like the fact that it's incomplete. That it's not all there. There's mystery. One of the boxes we've 
really made a mistake of putting together is making Jesus a completely like us kind of guy with the blue eyes and all that sort of silliness when in fact it's a person of power and mystery that we can barely understand. This is another picture. Now, I'm throwing this in as an aside. You all know what this is. This is the Shroud of Turin. I just want to make this little tiny point that the Shroud of Turin and one of the very first, if not the first, icon of Christ have an awful lot of similarities. And the ancient Orthodox know this. They know that something caused their monk artists to image the Christ in this way. And I suggest to you that this could be that something. Perhaps. In other words, there is an ancient tradition that the image of Christ was known and wound its way down to the faithful, to these icons. And there it lives in this monastery. I just want to point out these rugged places which represent the kind of rugged spiritual discipline it takes to find one's way into deeper meaning. It cannot be a hobby. It cannot be a habit. It cannot be reduced to a ritual. It takes everything. And these early Christians, these early monks, went on journeys that were life and death for the meaning that they were seeking. Just want to remind you, this image is that of Mount Sinai. Something did happen pretty astonishing on Mount Sinai, if you recall your Sunday school classes. Even those of you who are no longer part of the church probably went to Sunday school, didn't you? And here you go with, of course, Moses, the Ten Commandments, the Revelation. All happened right here. So out of those rugged desert cliffs is this history, this experience that sort of brings a sacred dimension to a place that one might not notice otherwise. I want to introduce you to St. Anthony very first monk in the Egyptian desert. He went out all by himself. He left Constantinople. He left the artificial world of his culture, the artificial church of his culture, in search of something else that his heart yearned for. And after 20 years or so all by himself, he realized in his aloneness, however satisfied he was, that he now had to turn around and help others. And so he created the very first Cenobitic communities, the very first monastic gatherings, those places that eventually became, guess what, boxed, controlled, formatted, Xeroxed into ritualistic religion. I want to introduce you to another early desert father, Ephraim the Syrian. I'm sure that very few people here have heard of Ephraim. He was one of the great theologians of early Christianity, of early Orthodoxy, of Eastern Orthodoxy. And he was a poet. So think about this. Their theologian in the early church was a poet. He wrote poetry and hymns. The theologians of the Western world, like Thomas Aquinas, wrote books this big. <coughs> See the difference? These folks worked at a different level than our later scholars. And by the way, if you don't happen to know this, Thomas Aquinas himself at the end of his life said, it's all straw. All of that mighty monumental intellectual work was all straw. And his new understanding at the end of his life. Just to give you a little tiny taste of these folks, words from Ephraim, from one of his hymns, Lord, shed upon our darkened souls the brilliant light of your wisdom so that we may be enlightened and serve you with renewed purity. Sunrise marks the hour for men to begin their toil, but in our souls, Lord, prepare a dwelling for the day that will never end. That's mystical. Experience, transformation. Another great early teacher is Isaac of Nineveh, Isaac the Syrian. Again, someone you probably have never heard of, who's left behind Magnificent works. He was one of the great teachers, one of those holy men of the desert who instructed men and women down through the centuries, really. To this day, Isaac the Syrian, 
Let's hear what he had to say. We turn up my mic a little bit, please. Where do you want? Turn it up. Be at peace with your own soul, then heaven and earth will be at peace with you. How about that? For you mystics out there, if you're at peace in your own soul, with your own soul, heaven and earth are at peace with you. Enter eagerly into the treasure house that is within you, and so you will see the things that are in heaven, for there is one single door to them both, the treasure house within you, the treasure house of heaven. This is 300 and some A.D. Meet Macarius the Elder, another great early father, as they call him, a desert father, another one who left his world, his wealth, his a great education and became a desert dweller and became a teacher, a monk, an enlightened being, a holy man. This is what he says, the soul that really loves God and Christ, though it may do 10,000 righteousnesses, esteems itself as having wrought nothing by reason of its insatiable aspiration after God. Insatiable aspiration after God. Though it should exhaust the body with fastings and watchings, its attitude towards the virtues is as if it had not yet even begun to labor for them. How about that? Down through the centuries, we've always seen that the saints considered themselves the greatest sinners. There was no pride there, no ego there. There was only that insatiable aspiration. And think of what life would be like, say, in a community like this. If two or three or four or a dozen people had such aspirations, what, what nuclear power we could gather in such self-sacrificial giving for something greater than ourselves. But we in the West, we like those 10,000 righteousnesses. I've never quite seen that word put that way. I don't know about you. I'm going to go do a righteousnesses. Says. <laughs> what can I do? And the real question is, who can I be? John Climacus, another marvelous scholar of the Spirit. A servant of the Lord is he who in body stands before men and women, but in mind knocks at heaven with prayer. <coughs> now think about what that means in a modern day sense. Stands before the world, before others, but inside is in prayer. You know what that is? That's what we call in the deep things of the faith divided attention, a consciousness of the world, a consciousness of God at the same time, the remembrance of God in the moment while other things are going on. If you're looking for the answer to the chaos within or the chaos around you, it's down this way. Where in the midst of all the noise and madness, you can be centered in a spiritual communion, connection with the holy. And this is what all the teachers have taught, and it comes from here. And that is my point, as you'll see here in a moment. But the mystics of the 16th century, as we'll see in a moment, have to say, all of them, Brother Lawrence, famous for saying he is as present to God at the altar in Holy Communion, in the Eucharist, as he is in the midst of the pots and pans in the kitchen. And that's a message to all of us, that anywhere, at Kroger's, you can be in an enlightened state. And maybe you'll be present enough to God that your goodness will shine forth and bless somebody right then and there while everybody's in a hurry. John Climacus wrote the divine ascent, the ascent of the latter. And he has 28 stages of this latter. This is one of the great books of those early days. Instructions to monks for people who were totally devoted to this, dealing with personal psychological issues, how to become humble, how to overcome arrogance, how to deal with anger, all these things that are very here and now. A psychotherapy these desert dwellers came up with. A systemic psychotherapy for the soul, which is alive and well to this day. This ladder to a higher state, to a higher way of being, to encounter with God, with our true self. Then let me introduce you to John Cassian. He's of special interest because 
He's one of those who came from the West and went to those desert fathers and learned from them. Some of us here may have gone to learn from. Maybe some are coming here to learn from. You know, you always need to find a teacher. Even if ultimately the inner teacher is within, you must find a teacher on the way. You must find perhaps multiple teachers until the day comes when everything in life is your teacher. This man was one of us, spiritual seeker, hungry for meaning, who went to find meaning where it was at, which in those days was Isaac the Syrian in the middle of the desert. Spent 20 years there. Then he came back to Gaul, you know, France, and wrote his conferences and his uh, established his understanding of these great teachings and bridged the far, the, the distant Middle East and the Western world. Pre-Roman, pre-Roman Catholic Church, an original expression of the source in the West, right here. In other words, our ancestors spiritually. Someone has put together a graph that may or may not be of interest here for you of all these different elements of uh, spiritual studies in humanity in the ancient times. And I'll point your attention, especially over here. Can you see that little red dot there? Hi there. Anybody, everybody see it? Okay. Over here, we have Cassian, the man I just spoke of, and Evagrius. I couldn't find his picture, which is why he's not here. There's not even a drawing of this mystery man. Let me just say something about Evagrius. He's the one who brought together the genius of understanding what was called back then the eight passions. By passions, he really meant pathologies of humanity. And it's a magnificent self-understanding of what is in the way for direct connection with spirit. And it's a little something for you to take home with you. This man's teachings, which are entirely available in Orthodox teachings, the passions, which culminate in pride as the greatest enemy, were corrupted down, misunderstood and reduced, Reader's Digest version, mistranslated into the seven deadly sins, which most people nowadays completely reject, make fun of, or use in movies. Those seven deadly sins of the Catholic Church are a poor recognition that there was ge spiritual genius to be found right there in Evagrius. So if you're really looking for something, you have to leapfrog over some obstacles to the mind and heart. Leapfrog over mortal sin to discover, wait a minute, this is about how to overcome rage, how to find inner peace. Very different than what has been fed down through the ages to the masses. You'll see right here, if my little button will work here, Origen, another great second century mystic teacher, brilliant man who could articulate these, this new wisdom in a world of high philosophy. The days of Plato, you see down there, Plato and Pythagoras. These folks were the genius of humanity. And this new teaching, this new revelation had to be able to speak to that world. Just like we, so refer, referring to the Christians now, have to speak to quantum physics. Have to know their language that they may understand the links in the common realities that we have. And my point here is these early desert fathers that we find here end up leading to names that are more familiar. Teresa of Avila, John of the Cross. Western, finally, something familiar, <laughs> rooted in these ancient ways. i just show you this picture because this is medieval, 13th century or so. And as you can see, some of you have seen this before, this fellow here has broken through a dimension into another dimension. Now, why are we talking multiple dimensions in the Middle Ages when finding a piece of bread was a big deal? Already, human beings had found that there was something more, you see, than just survival and so forth. So I just want to point out to you that 
Back then already there was this awareness of higher consciousness, of another way of being, of not just buying into you know, the knights and the lords and the serfs and the killing as reality. Julian of Norwich, just one, I use her as an example of the many marvelous mystics of the 14th century, 12th century. You heard another one here before we began. Hildegard of Bingen, who revolutionized spiritual music from the familiar monks' chants, the Gregorian chants, to this sound that is totally different and stirs the soul to this day. All of these people are influenced, even unconsciously, by these ancient teachings. And here, the great one, of whom we can't find any kind of picture, I first found this one down here, and I figured that wasn't going to work. That might just uh, give you nightmares or something. <laughs> there he is right there. This, of course, is Meister Eckhart. Master Eckhart. They called him Master. And he is still, to this day, at the height of great mysticism. Listen to this. You ought to sink down out of all your yourness and flow into his hisness. And your, yours and his, his ought to become one mind. So completely that you with him perceive forever his uncreated isness and his nothingness for which there is no name. 14th century. Now what happened to him is that they went after him for excommunication. Because in those days and probably to this day, that did not sound kosher to the Catholic Church. That was too incomprehensible. And so they put him on trial, this great master of Christianity, to try to f figure out how they could turn him into a heretic. And one of his students said to the priests and the Pope and all that, you understand him from the point of view of time, and he spoke to you from the point of view of eternity. How about that for dimensions? Those of you who come from Eastern teachings will recognize here something very familiar. Am I right? Very Buddhist, very Zen, and yet it's at the heart of Christianity. And this man was influenced by, see if you can write this down real quick, Dionysius the Iropagite. <laughs> Say that three times real fast. Dionysius the Iropagite. Actually, it's pseudo Dionysius the Iropagite who was one of the Desert Fathers who wrote these mind-blowing things on the celestial hierarchies and other things, and Meister Eckhart found them and translated into the West the thoughts of the ancient East. And then this fellow right here that many of us love very much, John of the Cross, 16th century poet. And just for the record, let's take a peek at some of that poetry. One dark night fired with love's urgent longings, ah, the sheer grace. I went out unseen, my house being now all stilled. You yoga folks, you meditation folks, my house now all stilled. You know he's not talking about having done some house cleaning. He goes out on that dark spiritual night, fired by that insatiable need for God that we heard about earlier. And then in the eighth verse he says, I abandoned and forgot myself. Laying my face on my beloved, all things ceased. I went out from myself, leaving my cares forgotten among the lilies. This poet, master poet, is trying to put into words a quality of consciousness. Third heaven, as Paul called it. Different cultures have different names for it. What it is, is a self-transcendent experience that maybe you've had in a split moment that has disappeared, and yet you knew then that you were touching something extraordinary. And one of the great teachings of this much abused religion is to help us human beings find ways to live that more often, to do the groundwork for that kind of higher consciousness, of encounter with God, or breakthrough of being. Becoming transparent to the divine, some call it. Purity of heart, others call it. That heals all our pain, all our psychic pain. 
takes away our loneliness, takes away our rage, takes away our hurt, and heals us. This is what salvation is. It is healing of the soul. And there it is. And yet this fellow here was hated by his fellow monks. They kidnapped him. They tortured him. And after he was dead, they cut him into pieces. Fellow Christian monks. Why? Because human beings are so much alike. Whatever form they take, this could be a Buddhist camp, whatever. It could be that orthodox thing with the big crosses. This morning I thought of telling you in the sermon, a, a CNN news report of Egyptian monks and Ethiopian monks who have the privilege of guarding the Holy Sepulchre where it is said that Christ was buried and resurrected. And each has a corner. And one day in July, an Egyptian tourist moved his chair out of the sun into the shadows and crossed an invisible line. And it generated a riot between the Egyptian monks and the Ethiopian monks. They threw rocks and iron rods at each other. Seven wounded Ethiopian monks, four wounded Egyptian monks. These guys who fast, who pray at three in the morning, who wear these big crosses. Boy, did they miss something, don't you think? They missed all this. The heart of the matter. I show you a classic Orthodox sanctuary. Don't worry, folks of Northward, I'm, I'm not going for that. Look. <laughs> Just a small morning comments. They want to create a beautiful place, a holy place. And if you go into St. George's Antiochian Syrian church uh, out there right down the street, those of you who have, you've told me this. You're not in Indianapolis anymore. You walk into another world, don't you? With incense, frankincense, with candles, with stillness, with reverence, with the sacred. And friends, we Protestants have bungled this so badly that it's time to go back to the source. It's time to realize that we have to feed the senses, feed the eyes, feed the nose, feed the ears with that which lifts us into a different place. The Puritans went way too far, just like we all do, don't we? We all get lunatic about something. And so from Luther on, they stripped all the statues, they tore out all the beautiful stuff, sort of like the French Revolution. Those of you who don't know me, who are wondering what, the, what kind of southern accent am I talking with. <laughs> Not a Hoosier. I grew up in France. And I grew up thinking the French Revolution was a wonderful thing. You know, fraternity, equality, all that good stuff. And then I find out about the reign of terror when 900 people a week were being, having their heads chopped off. Rivers of blood. They even chopped off the heads of their puppies. Aristocrats, you see. We all go too far. That balance thing, that middle road is profound, mature wisdom that most of us miss out on. So one could say, well, that might be too far too. However, what it is, is a recognition that we must have places in our lives where the holy is center stage. Where all the rest of it, all the mundane is aside and we are an environment that truly feeds the spirit. And I want to show you that these ancient teachers you've heard of, these people from long ago, their teachings still exist. Here you have a current monk from uh, St. Catherine today. Okay, so I'll agree, they wear funny hats. <laughs> and they like their, you know, I'd have one of these, but my wife won't let me. <laughs> today, this is modern times dealing with these teachings. Modern times, 19th century, I want to introduce you to Seraphim of Sarov, known as the St. Francis of Russia. You know, there was a Russia before the Bolshevik Revolution, before the arms race, before the Cold War, before the James Bond movies. There was a place called Holy Russia, which since 800 had become a deeply spiritual place. And I've discovered in my life that the Slavic people, maybe we've got a few descendants here today, seem to carry in their genes something of the mystical and the intuitive. I'll just mention Dr. Charles Ashman as one example 
of the kind of rich and holistic spirituality that comes out of those regions. Very different from what we know from the Catholic Church and the Protestant Church. Sir from of Sarov, another saintly human being who never thought of himself as saintly, but had transcendent qualities that would rival the greatest uh, Hindu uh, mystic, the greatest teachers of all time. He is the one I told you about who, in a discussion with a fellow named Molotov, who wrote this down, as they spoke of Holy Spirit, and he tried to share with him something of this high state, suddenly had light shining through him that lit up the entire surroundings around them and virtually blinded this gentleman. Just a moment of extraordinary light of Tabor, they call it. Mount Tabor, where Christ was transfigured. Mystery beyond what the mind understands. Here's one of those people. This is John Maximovich. He only died in the uh, late 60s. He was Archbishop of Shanghai, Archbishop of Europe, Archbishop of San Francisco. Little guy, strange looking. He's the fellow I told you about. Who went into these horrific prisons where the worst of criminals were locked up. And these people of ultimate darkness would fall to their knees and weep like little children just on seeing him because they could sense at a level they didn't know they had the goodness coming out of this man. Ironically, he also was martyred in San Francisco by his own congregation because they were building a giant cathedral that is there to this day and he was in charge and so all of the gossip, slander, pickiness, uh, nastiness surrounded him until it killed him right there in the place where he taught these things. This fellow here died at age 48, uh, I believe in the early 80s. He's known as Seraphim Rose and he was a PhD at Berkeley studying Chinese. When he discovered the teachings of the desert fathers and mothers, and as you can see, he sort of changed directions. He has written some extraordinary works, which after the wall fell, after the collapse of communism and things opened up, <coughs> it was discovered that throughout Russia, they were reading Xerox manuscripts of this man's works. So it had come full circle, you see, from out of Northern California, near Reading in that area, this man and his group called uh, the Brotherhood of St. Herman of Alaska, who to this day publish books of these teachings, uh, had been able to reach Russia that had lost its connection with its own spiritual legacy. One could argue that he too went perhaps too far. You don't have to have that beard. You don't have to live in utter poverty, and I'll share with you that some desert fathers did not bathe, and he turned it into a teaching. So uh, he didn't bathe. Uh, I don't recommend it. Uh, you know, it's just that human thing. Everybody gets carried away, right? Some of us eat too much chocolate. Others don't bathe. What can I say? Now, these are my friends who wrote that book, which is on that table over there. And my point that all of this is real close to home. This is Alphonse and Rachel Gottman. He is an Orthodox priest. She is one of the most radiant human beings I've ever met in my life. My wife and I went to see them in 1989, and we've remained very dear friends ever since. We've translated five of their books. They have, in their humble ways, become master teachers of this transformative way of being throughout Europe. For 20 years they've been holding retreats and getting people from all over the place. They don't speak English yet. The rest of the world coming to them to learn things like the prayer of Jesus, like these other methodologies that are unfamiliar to people. 
Turning to the source, Alphonse tells me, finding that extraordinary illumination. And just to further make my point, I thought I would share this letter with you. Look at this. 28 July, yeah, Juillet, July 2008, just the other day. Cher Ted, that's me. <laughs> and I want to point out one line. May the Lord accord to all your readers, and to you, the grace of interior silence and the discovery of the treasure of the ancient tradition. A blessing from these people to you right now. That's how close we are to that ancient tradition, to that timeless wisdom, to that legacy for all human beings. Right there, a word for you. These folks live, just in case you're going there, right there. Right outside of Metz in eastern France. Rebecca and I took a 6 a.m. train from Paris to Metz, right there. And had an afternoon we'll never forget. Again, this is here and now. This is Bethany, their home. I receive a quarterly journal from them have for the last 20 years, where extraordinary things are happening, where people are truly becoming people of light, finding the kind of inner healing that makes them what God wants us to be. And this is the result of their work, of their retreats, of their studies right here. So this is now a section I will take you through little pieces of the book, simply to give you a taste, not for the purpose of buying the book, but for the purpose of having some experience of what this is about. We'll start out with uh, simple in the extreme, which is always good, right? Simple in the extreme, available to the poorest individual, that is, everybody, as well as to the greatest contemplatives. This prayer, the Jesus prayer, leads to the penetration of deepest mysteries. And you'll see it tells us, makes us pilgrims on a journey towards our promised land, which is our own heart. No matter what we're doing, see, in fields or factories, cleaning a house, supermarket, etc., this teaching helps us to be present to God wherever we are, whoever we are. And this is classic teaching from the desert mothers and fathers, constant interior prayer, which is a state of consciousness, conscious awareness of God. Not words, consciousness. Maintained in this consciousness never ceases to deepen and transmute itself. It's a living thing. This awareness of a bottomless present leads to the disappearance of thoughts. If you're ever wondering, how do I stop the radio in my head? How do I stop the imagination in my head? Here's an answer. Disappearance of thoughts, especially our multiple desires, the great symbol of the ego, like oil, the holy name fills us with its presence. They are giving us not merely a tool, but a pathway to another dimension. They tell us the first the prayers pronounced with our lips, always putting our heart and mind into it. There's an ancient saying, bring the mind into the heart. And we'll talk about that at some other time. Lovingly focusing our attention on God, each word of the prayer absorbing our whole consciousness. At other times... It can be said between long intervals, and I want to point this out to you, which we simply taste this atmosphere of the presence. So you see, this is not a prayer of petition, I need this, help me with that. It's not a prayer of intercession for the moment, for others it is a entering into the presence. And they give us this wonderful poetic example, much like a bird beating its wings once and letting itself glide. I'm sure you meditators know what that means. In, a, in an act of abandon, abandonment, surrender, thy will be done. Just as that bird discovers there's no void beneath it, so we through the prayer discover the presence which precedes and accompanies us. Just a little taste. At the beginning of the spiritual life, there is first a separation which strips us from all that is useless. It is necessary to turn off the TV. It is necessary to shut down the overwhelming noise of life on our senses that keeps us hypnotized or in a state of agitation. 
Like we all have ADHD, as I've said before. We have to find a place. Check out the chapel garden. This separation is a physical necessity. We enter solitude, which alters everything. Once this physical space is open, it becomes an interior reality. It creates a state of the soul. You see, if we don't even know what it feels like, what it tastes like to be in an interior peace, we don't know what we're going after. We don't know what we're aiming for. We reject it often because we don't understand it. But we have to get there just to begin the spiritual journey. Before beginning this prayer, this process that you'll see in a moment, the Father has considered one other important thing, warming the heart. How about that? Warming the heart. The dissipated intellect does not enter into itself, does not unify itself to the heart unless attention is drawn into through warming the heart. And, he su and they suggest that if you cannot warm the heart, that is to say, listening to beautiful music, looking at a beautiful painting, smelling the cut grass in the air, whatever it takes for you, we need the help of a way which has proven itself in our past. Where we are touched and seized and shaken us. Whatever it is, you see, this is where spiritual discipline begins. We waste our attention, the power of our attention, the moments of our life. We don't realize what we could be gaining from just being alive right now. By discernment, by knowing what will feed the soul right now. We could all be watching, watching an Arnold Schwarzenegger movie which generally won't feed the soul. It will tear up the nervous system. It will stir up bloodlust, make us want to hit somebody, but it won't feed the spirit. We have to make these choices. Among the great ways of roaming our heart is this experience of those privileged moments. That's the best way we could translate it. And these are moments that you've had. we will fill with a burst of light, warmth, happiness, you can always remember the hour, the moment, the place, and you think of one, when something happened, they call them starry hours, found throughout our life from earliest infancy. I remember as a little boy in a little French village, I used to like to sit on a rock and just sit there. I didn't know why, but it, it did something to the spirit. And maybe you, in a moment on the beach, on a mountain, wherever, something Somewhere you have tasted these special moments. And to remember that, and to not take it for granted, to not forget about it, is part of the development of warming the heart, of awakening. In the mental phase, there are multiple phases, as you can imagine. Uh, in the intellect, the words are articulated consciously, resonate to our interior ears, can be visualized. This is all one level. Those of you who know Ignatius of Loyola, Used imagination, picturing things as part of the effort. Visualization, I know, is used in yoga and other places. But it's one stage. It's a beginning stage. And this is very important. An attitude of watchfulness. And they tell us this is a complete stranger to the ego, the ego, the illusion of self, which disappears before it. In other words, you can't be full of self and self-interest while looking at something beautiful. The ego is always active on the surface, while watchfulness is a non-action. There we eat, east meets west. Encounter in depth, in the silence of being from which we receive everything, and which leads us at every step. We then live in an atmosphere, in absolute freedom from result. How about that, you Westerners? Freedom from result. All of us are result-oriented to an obsessive, compulsive degree. And to be liberated from the need for results so that we could just live the journey is a spiritual experience. To free oneself from all thoughts and worries requires a continual inner battle. It doesn't happen on its own. It isn't something easy. It is a demanding, the most demanding thing of all, invisible warfare, spiritual warfare. And here's a word that nobody's heard of here, I'm sure, maybe one or two. Nepsis, a Greek word, which is watchfulness, awareness, watch of the heart, state of restraint, of extreme vigilance and attention. They tell us all these terms are quasi-synonymous among the fathers. Only the restraint of thoughts and worries makes possible union with God. You can't be full of worry 
and unite with God. You can't be full of fear and have faith. You see, we're going in different directions. For it releases us from our troubles and our passion and gives us with the help of grace a pure heart. Blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. Now, this is a magnificent example of the psychology of the ancient teachings. Entirely contemporary. This is how to deal with a thought coming into your mind. Which most of us don't even know we're having because we just think it's us. So this is big time spiritual teaching. It, the thought, begins innocently with a simple suggestion, some word or picture. Just something comes into our mind. If the soul dialogues with it, that is, if we get stirred up with it, if we reflect on it, if we spend time with it, then comes the ascent. When the object lodges for a long time in the soul and it gets used to it. Think of an example for yourself. Let's say, I don't know, jealousy. Something that's toxic. Jealous thought comes in. You start... Spending time with it. You start thinking about it. In the shower, at night, next day. You know that experience? And finally comes captivity. So from one simple suggestion, one simple thought in the mind, it goes into the heart, and we become captives of it. Heart is dragged along involuntarily. St. Basil says that we must watch over ourselves and always have our attention in an awakened state. And our mistake is we assume that everything that comes through our mind or our emotions is ourselves. Whatever is happening in center stage, we have no consciousness of good and evil in what happens in our minds and in our hearts. So anything goes, you see, and we're driven around every which way. Powerful teaching. Here's something for those of you who are seeking the holistic way. A relaxed body is critical to interior attention. Letting go of our body, surrendering ourselves. The most important thing is not to look too much at oneself or one's problems, but to believe in this love, in this consciousness. This is the mechanical phase of the prayer. They're going to come in to some more of this relaxation as a necessary thing. This is one paragraph that is very precious to me. Let's share it together, see what it does for you. In the beginning we perceive it as a small vibration of silence in the background of our being. We discover eventually that it is always there as a depth behind our consciousness and that we can rest in it at will even in the midst of the daily whirlwind. But progressively it becomes more and more clear like an immense silent ocean which vibrates in our depths, a real presence with which the Jesus prayer links up, dialogues with pools living waters as from a well. Immense silent ocean the depths of your being. Something within that breaks through any barriers that we think are the containment of our identity. Linking us with spirit. I'm not going to go over all this. I just want to point out a few things very quickly. The continual metamorphosis. It's a French book, so there's lots of fancy words. Uh, breathing is a path of transparency to mystery. So the ancient teachers figured out that simple breathing, as so many Eastern teachers know, is a pathway to a deeper connection to spirit, a disconnection of the ego and all its tensions. We may experience at the end of exhalation, as we breathe out intentionally, a mysterious moment of deep silence, just in simple breathing. This brief instant expands as we surrender ourselves to it. It progressively reveals itself as a presence, as someone. And this perhaps is the difference between Christian revelation and Buddhism and other things. It's one thing to have a sense of the great higher mind of vaster transcendence. It's another thing when that greatness, that higher something becomes someone. A personal connection to personal being. Each inhalation receives the divine breath as you're in your consciousness of the reality of God. As you breathe in, you're breathing in the life force that God has given you. Arising toward the light which enlightens our consciousness through this mystery. Each expiration is a descent towards the depths. We release it all to receive this unknown being 
who nevertheless resembles us in that we are intertwined. As we come to rest, and I've got the word Hezekiah there, this is one of the great words of that tradition, Hezekiah meaning inner tranquility, inner silence. Exhalation slows and becomes deeper. So, here is the mechanical methodology for those who would use this particular prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, breathing in, Son of God, during the silence at the end of the inhalation, have mercy on me, a sinner, breathing out. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now, before anyone gets too concerned about dogma, let me make this point. What we have here is consciousness of self as sinner, as one who has gone off track. Amartano, sin, means missing the mark. And consciousness of holiness, consciousness of self, consciousness of God. It's that dual awareness that begins to create transformation. It proves too difficult for those of us who are too uptight. You can say, Lord Jesus Christ, breathing in, Son of God, breathing out. Have pity, breathing in, on the sinner, breathing out. As they say, some very tense people can't, can't even breathe in one word. And you know we've got lots of uptight people among us. So sometimes all you can say is one word. Yeah. Whatever that word is, that which invokes the holy for you. I'm just giving you a tease here. If you're interested in a paragraph that you're missing, it's in that book over there. <laughs> Every true prayer set in humility leading to the death of self and surrender to the hands of God ends in inflaming the heart. How about that? Death of ego, not of actual self, leads to inflaming the heart, that warming of the heart. And I'll bet that everybody here knows something of that. That moment when you did something, where you pushed the envelope in being good to another, in really transcending what you wanted, and knowing you did something beautiful for God, that inflames the heart. That changes us as human beings. That which begins only as an exercise, quickly leads towards coming into presence. So it goes from words to experience. You see, many of us still think of prayer as just words. Ceaseless prayer. Can you imagine Paul saying, pray always, and having us mumbling all the time? It's a state of awareness that they are discussing. Now, this, this is a little different, but I'll just share it with you for the sake of contemporary thinking. A sensation received in a pure state operates an immediate disconnection of the nervous system, places the soul and body in silence. Human beings cannot feel and think at the same time, and this is a great secret. In other words, to open yourself to something deeper, you have to intentionally focus on that sensation in a way that sort of dislodges you from your normal <coughs> way of life. So we're concluding now, if the gospel is good news, such a cry of joy from beginning to end, it's because in revealing human beings to themselves, it offers us at the same time the possibility of experiencing God within ourselves, here and now. This is theosis, divinization, God-realization, the heart of early Christianity, totally forgotten after 1054, and just now appearing on our shores in our awareness. Only in the last 40, 50 years have these kinds of books appeared in English. And it's our opportunity to put aside our prejudices or our assumptions of religion and rediscover the heart of it. Thank you very much for your attention. And I open the floor to questions if you want to turn the lights on. Please.